we're interested in understanding reproductive processes. Um, and um, there's a lot of things that are required for reproductive success, but what we're mainly focused on is how sperm and eggs actually get together at the moment of conception. Reproductive success is a subject of great medical, social, and economic importance. The events of fertilization are fairly well described, however, their molecular underpinnings are poorly understood. And so we would like to understand how sperm and egg interact with each other, um, not just for the, from the point of view of understanding fertilization per se, but also understanding the universal cell biology of how cells communicate with each other um, that's important for the develop our own development and, and progression of disease and things like that. There's also a lot of compelling reasons to study um, fertilization processes. Um, uh, in the U.S., about one in six couples have fertility issues. The other side of that equation is we also want to have um, effective contraceptive strategies. We, of course, would love to do all our experiments on humans to understand human reproductive biology, but there's many practical and ethical reasons why we can't do that. And so we turn to a model system, um, in our case, a small nematode worm called Center of Dites elegans. C. elegans comes in two sexes, a uh, hermaphrodite and a male. C. elegans is a good model system for studying fertilization because number one is they're reproductively mighty. A single hermaphrodite worm can have anywhere from 200 to 300 progeny on its own. If it meets up with a male, it can have literally thousands of progeny. So if we find mutations that severely affect fertility, it's quite dramatic. A worm uh, that's only having um, uh, one or two or no progeny versus a worm that's having hundreds of progeny is really quite easy to spot. And so it allows us to really find the needle in the haystack where we have specific mutations that affect the reproductive success of the animal. Another nice thing about the worm is they're transparent, so we can actually watch events surrounding fertilization in live animals. Nematode sperm look a little different from the sperm most people are used to seeing. So rather than having a tail and swimming, nematode sperm are amoeboid and crawl. So they have a pseudopod. So rather than putting a propeller in the back, they have a sort of tractor treads in front and it drags the cell body behind it. Actually, in the greater scheme of things, sperm morphology or the way sperm look is quite diverse and that sperm are adapted to the environment in which they have to function. Some sperm morphological types are actually quite mysterious, and we can't explain exactly why sperm are a particular size or have particular structures on them, but that's one of the things that we hope to learn about. I've been here since um, 2000, so about nine years now. Um, and so when we first arrived, we primarily focused on um, mutants that affected the sperm's ability to fertilize the egg. And so what we had identified is basically um, sort of cellular molecular Velcro, the molecules that sit on the surface of sperm and allow it to um, recognize when it came in contact with the egg. Recently, we identified a protein on the surface of the egg. An interesting insight that we got from discovering this molecule is that molecules that are involved in diverse functions also could be involved in fertilization. Our research is primarily aimed at understanding um, the diversity of reproductive strategies, and that um, uh, technologies uh, hopefully will arise out of that, but we don't do it with an eye towards um, developing some sort of new contraceptive strategy or treatment for specific types of infertility.